very much for a chance to speak here. Uh, so the title of my talk is indeed not in physics, and uh, I know that the title of the conference is the Planck scale, so you might wonder if there is any connection between the Planck scale and not. Uh, uh, and I hope to uh, tell you that uh, there are some connections and to convince you that they are uh, interesting. Uh, all I will be talking about is related to certain exactly solvable theories, which might serve as some models of some physical phenomena. They don't necessarily tell us how really the nature looks like, but hopefully give some hints how some uh, quantum effects might, uh, might look like in some, in some cases. So, uh, to start with, let me briefly say what I mean by knots. And by knots, I mean just what mathematicians uh, mean by knots, namely some objects which you can make from a piece of a string. Uh, these are some examples which you can do really at home. I'd like you to convince you that these knots are not only the official equipment of Boy Scouts of America, but they also can be as very useful equipment of a theoretical physicist. So this is how you can play with them, but what mathematicians do, mathematicians consider knots which you can make on a closed, uh, closed string. So you have to take some three-dimensional manifold, it can be R3, but it also can be something more complicated, and a free manifold. And you want to embed there uh, a curve, a closed curve which does not intersect uh, itself. And then uh, mathematicians find various classifications of these knots, one way to classify them is to project on a plane and find a configuration for a given knot such that you find minimal number of crossings. So these are examples of uh, some least complicated knots. The simplest one is this one. This is called a trivial knot. The second one is a trefoil. And they all have the numbers. This capital number or big number denotes the number of crossings you see in a plane. So for example, for trefoil, you can see three crossings. And this number of three tells you about that. And this index is just enumerates uh, various knots with the same number of crossings. So this number is growing very, very fast. You can see that for six crossings you have three different knots, and for seven you have already seven different knots, and this is growing exponentially. So what mathematicians want to uh, find, this is one of the holograids in mathematics, uh, is to find so-called not invariant certain more manageable objects like numbers or functions which you can associate in some algorithmic way to, to a knot. And then they would like to tell you if two, if you have, for example, two different projections like this one and this one, mathematicians would like to tell you that they, are, they really represent different knots, which are topologically different. So you cannot, just by moving smoothly these pieces of a string, transfer one into another. So they would like to have, let's say, some function which you associate in some algorithmic way to one node or another one. If you compute this function with uh, these two functions, if you get different results, it means that nodes must have been different. So this is what mathematicians do, but this is not quite what I'm uh, interested in in the first instance. It's just setting a stage. I'd like to uh, tell you that these nodes appear in various contexts in certain exactly solvable theories. Some of them you probably have heard of, maybe not about all of them, so I hope to review these various places uh, where, where nodes appear. So first of all, one can associate to not certain observables in topological quantum field theories, especially in Chern-Simons theory. This has been found uh, by Witten around 1990 or 89, and uh, probably m many of you must have heard uh, of that. So this is, uh, let's say, the first uh, explicit connection to physics. You have some quantum uh, gauge theory, and certain observable in, in this theory compute this not in variance that mathematicians are interested in. It turns out that this turns simons theory is itself re related very much to three-dimensional quantum gravity. So I also suspect that many of you are aware of this connection. Uh, one thing is that you need to choose a very special gauge group in this Chern-Simons theory. If you choose it to be SL2C, then it turns out that the action for this Chern-Simons theory with this gauge group, you can rewrite as uh, three-dimensional uh, gravity action. And then following techniques of quantization in Chern-Simons theory, you can consider quantum gravity in three dimensions. There are certain subtleties, and uh, you might say uh, that this gravity is not very interesting, because you know there are uh, no local degrees of freedom. Uh, 
but there are certain topological effects which you can still uh, understand quantum mechanically. There is some kind of black holes in the three-dimensional quantum gravity which are called to BTZ black holes, so they have also some interpretation in the Strong-Simons theory, so somehow that, that's interesting. And then you can use this uh, in Chern Simons theory and more general uh, theories related to that and certain not invariants as a testing ground for certain dualities in string theory. So in fact many of the things I will be talking about is related to string theory and M theory. And uh, this type of dualities I have in mind are either geometric transitions, these are some transitions where uh, space-time changes its topology. So this is something hopefully closer to what you have in mind when you think of the Planck scale. You know that at the Planck scale various things may happen. And I will show you some kind of toy model, but toy model which captures all quantum uh, aspect of, uh, of such a transition, where indeed uh, some change of space-time topology happens, which is in a sense quite uh, drastic. So this is one example of some duality. Another one is so-called mirror symmetry. You might have heard about this name uh, as well. Also, using knots, you can illustrate certain aspects of mirror symmetry. So this is in one or another way related to string theory. You can generalize this picture and go to M theory. And then it turns out that M theory tells you uh, some things which are even more interesting among the others you can generalize or provide some new formulation of uh, some family of knotted variants. This formulation goes under the name of Oguri and Wafa invariants. So this is what I will uh, briefly mention as well. And finally, I'm not sure if I will have enough time, but if I do, then I will tell you something about M5 brains and yet another connection between uh, knots and, in this case, supersymmetric gauge theories. So that's roughly uh, the plan of my talk. And to start with, uh, I will briefly recall, recall uh, how this topological th field uh, theory arises in the context of knots, namely the Stern Simons theory. As you probably know, this is the action of this theory. So we have a gauge theory with A, which is gauge connection. K is some uh, coupling, which is called a level in this context for some consistency reasons. It turns out that this has to be integer. And then it turns out that there is an interesting class of observables in this theory, which are Wilson loops, which are traces, possibly in some representations, of the exponent of the integral of this gauge connection along some curve. In particular, you can take this curve to be a closed curve, so it, it can represent some node, like this one in this picture or any other one I had in the previous transparency. And uh, on general grounds, you can argue that the if you make this computation, the result should be topological invariant. Because this action does not itself depend on the matrix of this underlying uh, space. It can also be shown that the integration measure in this path integral uh, does not depend uh, on a metric. So if you perform this computation, you get the result, which is, it turns out, this is some not invariant, which is which reproduces not invariants known by mathematicians. In fact, in particular, there is a class of invariants which are called Humphrey polynomials. And this computation, with some identification of parameters, which is given here, the result of this computation is just a polynomial into parameters Q and A. And this polynomial is the same as the one which mathemati mathematicians found, which is called Humphrey. So as you see, Q captures uh, information about both k, which was this coupling, and also n, which is the rank of the gauge group. In fact, uh, in most of what follows, I will uh, restrict myself either to SUN or SLN gauge group. So that's also a bit surprising. If you make this complicated integral, the answer is just a polynomial in this special variables. And then a is just a nth power of q. If you restrict this capital and rank of the gauge group to be 2. So if you consider SU2 theory, then you get a polynomial which is called uh, Jones polynomial. This is a specialization of, uh, of this Humphrey polynomial. And Jones got Fields medal for uh, this discovery. So that's an important object. And in fact, this is quite, quite simple. Let me just give you an example because that may look complicated. But if you compute this Jones polynomial, which is nothing like this Humphrey for n equal 2, and if you choose this representation are here to be just fundamental representation, let me denote this just 
in this way. So then you get something which is just a polynomial in Q. So this is just some simple polynomial for, for this, this particular knot, of course. For different knots, you get different answers, but uh, that's what you uh, get ultimately. So it seems that quite heavy physical machinery is behind the scene, but at the end you get some simple expression. And uh, so this is how, uh, how this Trent Simons theory knows about, about knots. Uh, I already mentioned, so I, I will not repeat that, uh, I'll repeat very briefly, that in this context, again, if you choose gauge group to be sl to c you get some reformulation of three-dimensional quantum gravity, but it's not quite a direction I'm going to, uh, to look at. Uh, I'd like to tell you more about uh, how this picture, this John Simons theory, can be embedded in uh, string theory and how these geometric transitions look like. So it turns out that this John Simons theory is a kind of effective theory of some version of string theory which is called topological string theory or sometimes it is called topological strings uh, for brevity. And uh, this topological string theory is uh, well defined only if the underlying manifold is three-dimensional Calabi-Yau space, complex three-dimensional or real six-dimensional with some uh, conditions. And in particular, if you take the space to be of this form as a tangent bundle to some free manifold M, it turns out that uh, this topological string theory reduces effectively just to turn Simon's theory. If you, just, if you take this M to be as free, then effectively the amplitudes in this version of topological string uh, agree with turn Simon's amplitudes and uh, not invariants if you somehow engineer the knot that you'd like to consider, but you don't even need to consider uh, a knot. I should stress that if you compute expectation, just vacuum expectation values in this turn simons theory, if you compute this path integral even without insertion of this uh, Wilson loop, you also get some uh, result which turns out to be an invariant of a free manifold you are considering. So you also get invariants of those free manifolds from the string theory perspective. This is some cartoon picture of uh, this uh, manifold in case M is S3, you have some distinguished uh, S3 and then uh, some bundle over that. You may view this like, like that. And it turns out uh, another name of, of this object is deformed conifold. It turns out that this is a certain deformation of certain uh, complex manifold which has very simple equation in four complex variables, which looks like, like this. As such, this is singular, and the singularity is called a conifold. This, uh, this is just uh, in this picture. You can deform this uh, singularity in one way by replacing it as zero by some parameter which turns out to be a size of this S3, so this is one deformation. But there is also another deformation into another manifold, which is called result conifold. Uh, formally, this is uh, the following bundle, complex line bundle over, over P1. And this manifold has a non-trivial two-cycle inside uh, itself. So P1 is, uh, uh, roughly speaking, the same as S2. So you see that this is a kind of geometric transition which takes you between S3, uh, some manifold which has non-trivial cycle which is S3, and another manifold which has non-trivial cycle which is S2. There is some singularity in the way. And uh, you can consider what happens with string theory either in this picture or, or this picture. This is referred to, uh, this process when you change this manifold to this one is referred to either as a conifold transition because all these manifolds uh, have conifold in their name or geometric tra transition as I said or open closed duality. This is so because here uh, I should have uh, stressed also in the beginning that in fact to have correspondence with John Simon's theory you have to consider a certain number of uh, brains in this topological uh, string theory, which have to cover this S3 part. So there are some three-dimensional brains, and you have open strings which can end on these brains. So in this, on this side, you have uh, some version of open uh, string theory. On this side, you don't have these brains anymore. In a way, these brains which are here are replaced by the size of this S2. So here we have just a theory of uh, closed strings. <coughs> 
And in fact, this duality is kind of toy model example of ads CFT correspondence. So probably you have heard of this correspondence as well. In general, this is uh, difficult and some things uh, are known about that. Uh, people are working hard to understand that. But this is a kind of a toy model like on a topological level. You have gauge theory on this side. As I said, topo this open topological string here you can just reduce to turn Simon. So you have uh, gauge theory and here you have some version of closed uh, topological string theory and some amplitudes which you compute here turn out to be equal to amplitudes which you compute here. So this is like a non-trivial test that two different string theories or gauge theory and string theory are equivalent. And in this case, you can compute these amplitudes exactly. You can compute them, for example, in perturbative expansion, but you can do that to arbitrary order or to infinite order in uh, expansion of the gauge coupling. You can also analyze some non-perturbative effects. So this may seem quite simple setup, but you can do very powerful quantum tests of uh, uh, and compare various uh, amplitudes. So everything I said uh, until now about uh, this system did not uh, include knots yet, but you can do them by including some additional brain in this topological uh, setup. And you have to engineer in such a way that it intersects this S3 on this side along a knot you are interested in. And in that case, it turns out that, again, this open topological string amplitudes on this side reproduce uh, not invariance associated to this knot. On the other hand, you can translate the system through the singularity uh, to, to the other side. As I said, you don't have this set of brains overlapping with S3. They are, in a sense, replaced by S2, but you still have this additional brain which represents the knot. So here you have closed string theory with this additional brain, and you typically compute uh, some I mean, when you compute amplitudes for this theory, you get uh, some objects which are mathematically called Gromov-Witten invariants. So in this way, you get some correspondence between this Gromov-Witten invariants and standard knot invariants. It turns out that uh, you can, in a way, reformulate this Gromov-Witten invariants uh, in this language related to, to knot theory. So that's already quite uh, impressive and non-trivial prediction which you get from considering uh, these topological strings here. And then you can generalize this setup to much more general class of manifolds, which are called toric manifolds, complex toric manifolds. In a way, uh, you may view them as being obtained. Uh, these are manifolds which may have many uh, singularities or may arise from resolving many of uh, singularities of this type, which are somehow uh, glued together. So, uh, essentially, that's one message which I uh, wanted to, to give, that using uh, ideas from string theory, you can relate some objects in knot theory to some mathematical quantities, such as Gromov-Witten uh, invariants, which have interpretation uh, in closed string theory. And then going further, you can also generalize this setup to M-theory. As you, say, uh, as you see, I'm quite general here. I'm not giving too much details. I'm just uh, trying to give you some impression of what people are uh, working on, and uh, that's why I'm quite um, schematic. Uh, but being schematic, let me very briefly review what M theory is. You must have seen this picture many times as well. You know that uh, there are several types of uh, ten-dimensional string theories, which have to be ten-dimensional for some uh, consistency reasons. But, uh, in particular, one of these uh, string theories is so-called type 2a string theory, which is characterized by certain coupling constant. Usually, in string theory, you make perturbative calculations, so you assume that this coupling constant is small and you compute something order by order. But it turns out that if you consider what happens when this uh, coupling is getting large, in that case, you in principle, you obtain some non-perturbative effects, and it turns out that this large coupling constant can be interpreted as an additional dimension, which is the 11th dimension of, of M-theory. And then various objects which you find in uh, string theory, in particular in this two type 2A theory, like different D-brains, fundamental strings, those different D-brains, and as five brains, which is yet another type of brain, and so on, they all come from two fundamental objects in M-theory, or even one fundamental object, which is M2-brain, uh, 
It has a partner, uh, in, a, in some uh, sense this is like uh, an, an electric uh, object and it has a dual magnetic object which is called uh, M5 brain. So in M-theory you have just these two types of brains which are respectively three and six-dimensional. If you reduce M-theory to uh, ten-dimensional theory, then depending how you make the reduction, for example from M2 brains you may get either fundamental strings which are the strings which you consider in string theory, or the two brains. It depends on whether you compactify on a dimension which is a part of this M2 brain or, or it is not. So uh, this is uh, kind of a picture that people have in mind. And there is uh, a big puzzle how to, what is the theory, like effective theory of, on this M2 or M5 brains? You probably have heard of, if you have D-brains, let's say more standard objects in string theory, then there is some effective theory which describes them, which is just supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. So this is well known. In particular, in Young-Mills, uh, you consider, in SU and Young-Mills, you consider matrices of size n by n, so you have roughly n square degrees of freedom, which you can uh, identify in some way in string theory. So this is known how to deal with uh, D-brains, but it is still at least to some extent, it is still not quite known how to deal with M2 or M5 brains. In fact, there was a major breakthrough a few years ago, which goes under the name of uh, Bagger Gustafsson Lambert theory or ABJM uh, theory, which, which is a theory found by this uh, four gentlemen, Aharoni, Bergman, Jafferis, and Maldasina, who found what is uh, the proper description of these parallel M2 5 brains. It was known that it cannot be Young-Mills theory because in particular the number of degrees of freedom which you have here scales like n to power three halves. And they found that essentially this, these M2 brains effectively are described by some version of Chern-Simons theory, but it has to be coupled. It has to uh, contain also some matter fields and quite large number of supersymmetry. So this has been found a few years ago. However, this is still unknown how to effectively describe M M5 brains. And this is one of the biggest puzzles, not even in string theory, but just, just as such. It is known that this M5 brains must be described by some six-dimensional theory with superconformal symmetry. And this super has to do with supersymmetry. This is supersymmetry of type uh, 2,0, whatever that means. It is known that uh, when you compactify this six-dimensional theory to four dimensions, you obtain n equal four Young-Mills uh, theory, which is also supersymmetric and has so-called S-duality. So this must somehow follow from also from this theory. And also the number of degrees of freedom here is n cube, but still it is the effective theory which describes this uh, M5 brains is not known uh, explicitly. Some properties of them are known, but uh, uh, one cannot, for example, write Lagrangian and tell you wh wh what that is. So something is known, something is not known, but still you can this M5 brains to, to get some predictions. Uh, and uh, to do that, one thing you can do, you can embed this picture I had previously with these conifolds and just six-dimensional manifold or this three-dimensional Calabi O manifold. You can embed that in this M-theory setup in such a way that this uh, T star S3, which I had before, it becomes just a part of this compactified space that you typically take in string theory. Then you consider just R4, and if you want to have M theory 11 dimensions, you need to take also another dimension, let's say that this is just a circle. So this original space-time I had was just this T star S3, but now I'm considering this setup where the space-time that one might say we are supposed to live is this R4. There, is some, uh, there are some additional dimensions. You take this M5 brains in such a way that three dimensions of six-dimensional word volume of these brains are wrapped on this S3, and another three dimensions is just S1 times R2, which is a subspace of this R4. If you want to represent a knot, I told you before that you also need to take uh, some additional brain in this setup, which has to intersect this S3 along a knot, so you take this additional M5 brain which also wraps S1 times R2 and then there is this Lagrangian brain which represents a, a given knot. And then you can reinterpret this geometric transition I mentioned before in this 
M theory context, either in ten dimensional superstrings or even in, in the full M theory. And then uh, some interesting things are found. First of all, these amplitudes, which were computed just by topological string, turn out to be amplitudes for certain specific sector of the full superstring theory. If you would like to compactify the superstring theory just to this R4 space, you would find different fields. In particular, you would uh, find gravity sector with gravitons and also gravi-photons. And uh, the, these topological amplitudes uh, essentially are amplitudes which tell you how these gravity photons and gravitons, uh, uh, what are their scattering amplitudes. Also, if you take these brains to be heavy enough, you get, uh, you may engineer black holes, some types of so-called BPS or half BPS black holes, and these topological string amplitudes tell you about the entropy of these black holes. So you can compute entropy, even some corrections to this entropy, and you can, uh, for example, uh, see that they satisfy bekenstein hawking law and, uh, and find some corrections to that. But furthermore, if you leave this to M theory, if you consider just this special sector where you have certain BPS states, then you can take a limit where you take this S1 to be large compared to the size of this uh, Calabiao manifold, and then you can reinterpret everything uh, in terms of counting of certain uh, states which are propagating uh, just on this circle. So this may sound, uh, well, a bit non-concrete and abstract, but I will give you some, uh, part, some uh, explicit formulas which tell you, I mean, uh, t tell you what the, what the outcome is. The point is that you can reinterpret some quantities you started with in terms of counting of some BPS states uh, in the same theory. And this formula is some explicit formula which uh, just tells you uh, in detail what I told you in Word. You can start from the very beginning, so you can start from this Stern Simons theory and then translate everything to this language. So on, on the left hand side of this equation you have uh, you have expression which involves quantities which you find essentially in Stern Simons theory, namely this Humphrey polynomials which I started with. You construct some generating function of this. It turns out that you can rewrite it uh, in this way. It may seem complicated, but what is crucial is that these functions f have on general grounds, they must have the following form, and they are expressed by some uh, numbers here which are integers, which is completely not uh, obvious from Trent Simon's theory viewpoint, but if you translate all that to, to the same theory picture, it turns out that uh, this just has, has to be so. So you can express this Trent Simon's uh, quantities in terms of some new invariants which are uh, certain integer invariants. This formula may look complicated, but you can also expand it. Uh, this V is like a generating parameter. You can expand it to any order in this V, and then you find effective formulas which relate these different conflict polynomials with uh, those functions F3, F uh, those functions F. So essentially, you get reformation of not invariant in terms of some degeneracies of BPS states in M theory. And you can do that. Uh, you can do that very explicitly and find some uh, results which are completely non-obvious when you would view them just from this Stern Simons theory or not theory viewpoint. So to do that, you have to consider one more, one more duality, uh, which is a duality between this closed string theory. As I told you, this is closed string uh, theory which computes certain gram of Witten invariants and this so-called A model topological uh, string theory. You can use mirror symmetry and relate it to so-called B-model uh, topological string theory. When you consider this mirror symmetry, you have to replace a given manifold which you consider by so-called mirror manifold. So, of course, this mirror symmetry is known for uh, many complicated uh, manifolds and people are trying to find most general one, classify this mirror manifold and so on. But in this case, I'm doing something very simple. In a sense, this is one of the simplest manifolds. It's just a resolution of this conical singularity. It has also some mirror manifold which is given by the following uh, equation. This is equation in four complex uh, variables u, v, x and y. So because th there are four complex variables with one equation, this is three-dimensional manifold. It turns out that for some special choice of this polynomial A, you get mirror manifold to, to this one. If you consider more general toric manifolds here, then you uh, get also more general polynomials A here. And uh, in particular, if you start with a setup 
where you include this additional brain which encodes information about some node. Then, if you follow this chain of duality, at the end, the string theory on this manifold also knows something about those not uh, invariants, and in particular, there is some, uh, let's say, quantum version of, of this object A here, which provides uh, certain recursion relations for these conflict polynomials which you uh, might have started with. So just to summarize, if I uh, forget about uh, many ingredients and all these dualities, the bottom line is that I have some uh, set of relation between some not invariants, some degeneracies which come from uh, M theory, and then some uh, algebraic curves or so-called A polynomials. These are this polynomials which I call this B model manifold. And uh, one observation is that. Uh, of course, as I said, this BPS degeneracies, this number n, are defined or they encode information about conflict polynomials. And also this quantum version of the say polynomials provides some recursion relations for conflict polynomials. So you might hope that this A polynomials know something about these degeneracies in, uh, in M theory. You can indeed make precise connections. And here are some even more explicit formulas which may seem uh, involved, but the final result will be quite, quite uh, simple. So if you take this equation I told you about, uh, this algebraic curve, if you solve it for y, if you assume that this uh, form of the uh, expansion given by Aguriye Waffa for m theory states uh, indeed holds, then you find that this y has to take the following product form. And uh, this degeneracies n, which I had before, now I'm considering some special limit where I, in fact, don't consider all of these degeneracies, but some combination of them, which I denote b. So this degeneracies b appear here in the exponent. So the statement is that if you know some uh, complex equation, this is just some polynomial equation, if you solve it for y, you can read off this degeneracies b. You can do that in a simple way, for example, you can just differentiate this y. If you take logarithmic derivative that you put these b's downstairs, so they are given here. On the other hand, if you know y, you can typically expand it just as in Taylor series, you get this summation, so you get two series with coefficients a n and this b r, which are related in some a little intricate way just because of this denominator. And if you heard something about uh, number theory, it turns out that this relation is something which is called Lambert transform in number theory. So if you know this y, what we would like to get are those b. But we may know, we may get this y from all the set of, of dualities which, which I told you. So essentially you would like to get b, but you know a, so you have to invert this relation and uh, express b in terms of a. So you can do that, this so-called Lambert transform, and this B have very explicit uh, formula like this. You take those terms uh, in this series with index n, which is divisible by all uh, uh, integer numbers d, and the coefficient here which you have to put is so-called Mebius function, which is given just 0 or 1 or minus 1, depending on whether this number d is just a product of uh, prime numbers taken each once or uh, there are some multiple products. So this is a prediction which you, you may say you get from M theory. And this is the prediction we've been considering in some work I've been uh, doing recently. So I can tell you what is the form of that. And in fact, this equation is very, very non-trivial. You might think that this is simple, but it gives you very non-trivial results even if you start with quadratic equation. So that's something that you do in your high school. Uh, and to be more precise, I get a quadratic equation if I look, for example, at this node. In fact, also for some other nodes, but to focus my attention, let me say that I start for, with Chern Simon's theory for this node. You saw these dualities I had, and at the end I find the equation of this form. This looks like y minus y square minus x y to power 4. If I use variable y square, uh, then this is just a quadratic equation in y square. And I would like to extract these numbers b, uh, which I have here, which represent the same theory multiplicities. So I do that uh, in the way, as I told you, I have to solve this equation for y square. So in fact, uh, it is very well known that from solving this particular equation, you get Catalan numbers. These are very well-known numbers 
which fall, uh, which are found in many uh, enumerative problems. So these coefficients here are 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, and so on. These are Catalan numbers. But you would like to put it in this product form. If you do that, at the end you find the following expression for this BR. So these are some combinations of these Newton symbols with these coefficients 1 or minus 1. And the funny thing is that in front of that, this is a consequence of this all set of dualities, you have this 1 over r square. And as I told you, the prediction of m-theory is that these have to be in integer numbers. So you get the statement that this combination of these numbers must be divisible by r square, which is totally non-obvious. You can try to prove that like uh, as you would do that uh, in other cases, but it turns out to be very non-trivial even, uh, even in this special case. So essentially you start with very special equation which looks like 1 minus y minus xy squared, just a quadratic equation, and you get a non-trivial statement in, uh, in number theory about integrality or divisibility of some combinations of Newton symbols. You get that from this M-theory general prediction. And in fact, this statement uh, general, it holds for any knot. I just give you, gave you the simplest example for this knot, but any knot you would start with gives you rise to this type of, of statements. So uh, these are more explicitly, if you would like to check what numbers you get, this is just a table with these numbers, so you can indeed check that they are integer, but uh, to prove it, uh, it's uh, a, bit, a bit harder. There is something even more interesting. It turns out that they are divisible not only by r square, but even by r cube. So there is some, you can put additional factor of r up to a constant, which I put here, 6 or 2. All these numbers, br, are also uh, divisible by this additional r, which is also some property coming from, uh, from this nth theorem. And uh, I gave you, in a way, trivial example, but this example, uh, this is the example which is a special limit of more general situation where you would start with SUN theory which has the second parameter A. So if you, in fact, this is a special limit where A, where you take some limit of, of this parameter A, if you don't take a limit you have more general polynomial which depends on X and Y and also this parameter A. So this is some A polynomial which represents this particular node. And from this more general structure you can also find this M theory multiplicity switch which are put in this table, they are also integer, which like from dot theory viewpoint is uh, completely surprising. Uh, positive, you say? Okay. Yes. Uh, no, in fact not, because more properly they represent something uh, which is called, uh, this is some generalization of Witten index. So they are counting the number of states, but in such a way if you have bosonic degrees of freedom you take them with plus sign, if you have, the, so they can be negative. So this is a difference between number of bosonic and uh, fermionic uh, degrees of freedom, that's why they in fact can be integer. So, as, as you see, uh, again, uh, you get for any node the prediction that some combination of numbers is divisible by r square. So, all of a sudden, like, number theory statements pop out from considering dualities in, in M theory. Uh, well, it is some generalization of that. You have to... Uh, the idea is the same as the Witten index, but you have to add some other weights which represent certain charges, uh, like from super string uh, context. So. But essentially, that's the difference between positive and negative uh, degrees of freedom. And well, of course, I, I don't have enough time to tell you all details. That's why that's why I wanted to show you something which I hope sounds uh, intricate and as it is uh, and uh, is interesting rather than uh, telling all the uh, details, which, well, that would not be possible to, uh, to, to present more details in, in this time, because I'm already almost running out uh, of, uh, of my time. So just to tell you, uh, the last part of my talk is related about yet another perspective of this M5 brains. I told you the effective theory of those is not uh, known, but still you can tell something about, about their properties by considering certain compactifications. <coughs> 
So one simple compactification is the one when you go from M theory to string theory. So from the viewpoint of M5 brain, you go from M5 brains to D4 brains. You know that effective theory on D4 brains is supersymmetric Young Mills. And uh, so essentially the statement is that if you compactify the six dimensional theory of several M5 brains, you get n equal for uh, supersymmetric Young Mills theory. So that's. This has been known uh, for, let's say, quite a long time. But it turns out that you can consider more general... Uh, sorry, uh, when you compactify on one dimension, you get five-dimensional young mills. If you compactify on a torus, you get four-dimensional uh, young mills, uh, and then you have an equal for supersymmetry. But in five dimensions, from compactification on a circle, you also get young mills. If you compactify to four dimensions, not on a torus, but on more general Riemann surface, you get more general class of supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, uh, which for which you can compute also some amplitudes or partition functions. In particular, there is a class of partition functions found by Nekrasov, so they are called Nekrasov partition functions. And it turns out that th through this duality, or this is a consequence of this duality, is the fact that this Nekrasov partition functions essentially compute some quantities which associate in conformal theory, conformal field theory, uh, so-called Uvel theory, to certain Riemann surface. Or more precisely, these quantities are called conformal blocks. It turns out that these conformal blocks are essentially equivalent, or they are just equal to this class of partition functions. So these two, like directions of research, have been conducted for the past, let's say, 20 years, completely independently. Or maybe this has been, of course, longer since the 80s this Louisville theory and CFT. The cross of partition functions were derived more or less 10 or maybe 12 years ago. And like five years ago, people realized that, in fact, these two branches are, are the same. So uh, now the question is how to relate that to, to knots, which is the title of my talk, and this three-dimensional stuff. And in fact, this is possible. You can consider yet another uh, compactification to three dimensions. In that case, instead of this Riemann surface, you have to, you can take some non-trivial three-dimensional manifold. In particular, you can take this three-dimensional manifold to be a complement of some knot. So on one hand, you compactify in this way, but on the other hand, uh, as an, uh, if you compactify on this non-trivial three manifold, then you obtain effectively uh, theory, let's say, in R3, which is some version of three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory as well. And then you find the statement very similar to this statement. This is often referred to as the AGT the conjecture, the, this relation between these two fields. So in three dimensions, when you compactify to three dimensions, you get analogous statement, namely certain amplitudes and quantities in this three-dimensional gauge theory turn out to be the same as certain uh, amplitudes uh, associated to knots, because if you start with a free manifold which is not complement, then, then you get also amplitudes associated to knots. So in this slide, uh, I essentially tell, tell the same thing which I just said, but in a slightly more detail. So the, th the detail is such that if you consider this uh, knot complement, in particular if you choose a knot to be so-called hyperbolic knots, then this knot complement can be decomposed into so-called ideal tetrahedra. And as far as I know, these are the same or almost the same tetrahedra which are used in some contexts in loop quantum uh, gravity. So uh, it seems that is some kind of a common point between what I'm talking about and some people in the audience might be interested in. And then to get this free manifold, you have to glue a certain number of this tetrahedra in some way. And you can also essentially find these amplitudes related to, let's say, Tron Simon's theory or uh, to, to this amplitude by gluing this tetrahedra. And on the other hand, in this dual three dimensional picture, this tetrahedra translates to the matter fields which you have in this supersymmetric theory. So if you know how the decomposition of this manifold into tetra ideal tetrahedra looks like, you can like, engineer or reconstruct the contents of this gauge theory uh, in this dual. Uh, set up and then you can compute amplitudes on both sides uh, and you, you can check that uh, they agree or you can from one side, if you know one side, you can deduce what is the theory on the other side. In particular, to a part of the amplitude or a quantity which corresponds to this tetrahedron is so-called uh, dilogarithm. 
And as I said, one of these tetrahedron corresponds to one chiral field. So if you compute effective superpotential, for example, in this gauge theory, then you see that this is composed of those of different uh, di logarithms, and from this structure you can deduce what is the matter content of, of this gauge theory. So to sum up, now you can use methods of supersymmetric quantum field theories, in particular in, in three dimensions, to study certain topological problems or to study, uh, in particular, uh, well, topology of these three manifolds, and also properties of M5 brains, which were like basic uh, starting point for, for this duality. And in fact, this set of dualities is much, uh, much more general. I will not discuss this picture, just tell you that this is borrowed from the lecture by Greg Moore uh, a couple of years ago. This, is, this S of G represents this theory of M5 brains, this six-dimensional supersymmetric field theory, and then there are various uh, other theories which turn out to be interconnected, in particular this AGT conjecture I mentioned, uh, this is just uh, mentioned here, and well, I, I don't have time to present that, but those different uh, acronyms represent different things like whatever, four-dimensional supersymmetric theories, cohomological knot invariance, geometric Langlands program, geometric representation theory, Leuven theory, and so on. So there is much research going like on behind uh, this picture. And then to sum up, uh, what I try to tell you is how uh, ideas between, well, let's say, behind knots and their, their, their physical interpretation appear from various contexts in topological field theories, but also in string theory and M theory, and the research is ongoing and a lot is going on. So if anyone is interested, I, I encourage you to, to, to join. And thank you.